Uh, today we want to talk about AOC and her comments that are being lambasted as verbal blackface. Um, she was at a National Action Network convention hosted by Al Sharpton, and uh, she got up on stage and was saying, there ain't nothing wrong with that. It's okay to be a bartender. Um, she was, you know, this I assume is in defense of the fact that uh, Trump at his speech had called, you know, called her out in a funny way as like being a bartender as that's a bad thing. He also um, made a comment recently where he was saying, um, oh, the Green New Deal, like that's stupid by, pardon me, that's stupid by virtue of the fact that it was drafted or made by a 29 year old bartender, yeah. a young bartender. Yeah, maybe, and maybe it's also in reference to that. I know he said a couple things about her being a bartender now. Um, the big criticism now that I was reading of in the Atlantic, although there were a few other sources, was that when she says, I'm proud to be a bartender, ain't nothing wrong with that. Um, she's being accused of verbal blackface or, you know, talking black or um, any number of other fun things that make me feel awkward because they sound racist. So as far as I'm concerned, I mean, I watched the clip. It's not a very long clip, but obviously the speech was longer. And she just kind of says there ain't nothing wrong with that. Like, I don't feel like it was overtly like super like she was trying to make this mockery of a dialect or something um and you know I, it just doesn't feel as though like when we watched obama do it and he gave that speech um where he was criticized for the same thing it felt really out of place for him when i watched that but watching her talk like it, it just kind of felt like this is something she might have said anyway regardless of audience um so i don't know I, i'm not sure if it's verbal blackface Certainly, I think that's a hyperbolic characterization. Blackface being a a really heavily, I'm not sure what the term is, it's uh, absolutely pregnant with um, different angles that are inappropriate about blackface specifically. And I yeah, think it's, it, it's... it represents a much more overt, much more caustic, direct racist tradition. Uh, and... AOC's comments, even if we were going to say for the purposes of this discourse that they were inappropriate, there has to be some distinction of, of uh, magnitude. And that's that comment that calling it um, verbal blackface seems to be very tone deaf to, to that idea. But going past that, I, I thought it was pretty cringy, man. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I didn't, I was not into this. I think it's another misstep for her. Um, I don't like the idea of, well, now that I'm back in, it, was this in her home constituency? Um, it was in New York city, but I don't know if it was in the Bronx. Uh, she's from the Bronx. So. Right. Right. I, I didn't like it. I didn't like the idea that, oh, well, I'm going to speak <laughs> in this different way, specifically to what, to rile up the, the already sympathetic crowd. Mm -hmm. Um, it didn't seem necessary and the ideas are good enough. I don't, I don't need a special accent to prove to me that Medicare for all is good. That's not what, what I want is words of action. And the, the more that I watch AOC give these type of speeches, because the work that she's actually doing in Congress, I have pretty much been blown away at how direct she is and, and how sort of on the mark and, and in uh, Twitter, she's very, she's very in control in that domain. But the more I watch her actual speaking engagements, particularly once in New York city, um, I feel th the platitude alarm is going off. Um, and I, I, I'm not, I'm not sold. Uh, I, I think that ultimately doing that opened her up to exactly this type of criticism in a way yeah. that was a tactical mistake. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I can't get away from the fact that some of the things that she was saying were, were as you said, platitudinous and, and kind of, uh, I think like the content of what she was saying, there were some things that I cringed at. Um, and I could see you like physically cringing. Um, but the way that like the way she was speaking, which is specifically what she's being criticized for here, like, I don't know. It just, it, it seemed natural to her. Um, the Atlantic does point out that, you know, she's from the Bronx and um, the various community members there of whatever heritages and so forth, when they're in that close of a contact, it's not uncommon for people to adapt, um, you know, dialectical mannerisms and things from the nearby cultures, from other groups 
and to you know use them when they're talking to these people and not use them when they're talking to these people and so on. Um, a common example that they cited in the, in the Atlantic is like when Spanish speakers will, you know, who are fluent in both languages will with one group, they'll speak completely fluent English, but with another group, they might throw in phrases of Spanish here and there. It's not done as a, um, you know, a racist thing. It's more just a, I'm, I, a connection with the audience, I guess would be a way to put it in this case. Linguists call it code switching. Um, if you look into linguistics, they're the, when they talk about code switching, they'll also talk about like the way that adults speak to children and the way that adults speak to their uh, superiors at work and things of that nature. And that, um, and in particularly like academics have to do it a lot um, when they're talking to people who aren't educated or aren't in the same field or things of that nature, because they have to switch the way they talk about what they normally would so that the person that they're talking to can understand what they're saying. Um, but that's not the sole purpose of code switching. I mean, it's, it's a pretty complex kind of thing, but the idea is we already naturally do it all the time. We, we already, when talking to our friends, our parents, our, you know, so on and so on, we'll change our tone, our word choice, things of that nature, just based on who we're talking to already. Um, yeah, I'm not saying that it's morally wrong for her to have done this code switch or yeah. used this code switching language, nor am I saying that it's racist. I'm saying that it was cringy and like kitsch. It just yeah, sucked. Like that. it sucked. I thought it was shitty. It was poor public speaking. Like I, I disagree with the move in a tactical sense. Present me the issues. They're, they're always, they're already attacking you for, for your age and for your lack of education. And, and so your response is to hand them a piece of fucking candy where they can take and say, look, you're an idiot. You're, you're doing this, this code switching thing. And then they just malign it and make you look, uh, make you look bad. I don't see, I don't see how this benefited her because the, the people that she was talking to were going to agree with her, whether she, whether she used their, this dialect or not and using it. The only thing that happened is it gave the right ammunition to come at her with more, completely stupid smear attacks and this one could have been avoided i think in in my opinion i mean obviously like i'm i'm a fuck in the middle of nowhere talking into a camera (laughs) but i feel like it's a fair analysis to say i would have avoided it it just seemed like she had had someone coaching her to like yeah now remember talk to the people this is these are your people this is where you're from like i want to hear that come out that that's what they're gonna want like she didn't need to be coached in that way yeah, and if she did it totally on her own ad lib, then like I, my criticism remains the same. Like, oops, you fucked up. Like I wouldn't do that again because look, look what happened. Yeah, um, and the, like, you know what's not being discussed here, the merit of her policy, mm. because it's it's completely been derailed again. Where we're not actually discussing any of the policy, the substantive, uh, actual issues that Ilhan Omar and AOC are engaging in on the Hill. We're talking about these little smear attacks that conservatives cook up. And increasingly we we've done a couple stories about this where they're making avoidable missteps that are, that are making this already dirty game easier for the conservatives to play and harder for AOC and Ilhan Omar. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you said a lot there. So like part, part of what, um, I wanted to get at later, which maybe we could start now Mm -hmm. is that um, you're talking about how she's making it easier for them. And she's doing um, all of these things that, you know, and not just her, I mean, there's others um, that are making it easier for them to attack her. At what point is it witch hunting? Because I mean, I don't expect perfection from any of the politicians. I don't expect any of the politicians to just go up and be amazing and perfect every single time. But you know, they're, they're, they're super hyper-focused on her right now and on Ilan Omar and a couple others. So at what point is it she just made a mess up or, and, oh, they're finding the mistakes because we don't like you, we don't like your message, so we're going to call you out on everything. No, that is what's happening, is yeah. they hate the message. They hate that these intelligent, young, um, relatable women are taking power and they constitute, I've said this a bunch of times on the channel, 
they constitute a legitimate threat to the hegemony. And so they're going to be smeared. The establishment fucking hates them. And it's it's going to try and destroy them. Old white yeah. men are going to try and destroy them. And I'm sorry, AOC. I'm sorry, Ohan Omar. You get saddled with the task of challenging that evil. And yeah. you have to play a fucking perfect game. You, you have to fucking... All the balls have to go into the pockets on your fucking opening hit. Uh, ultimately, I mean, I, I guess kind of what I'm pushing at or poking fun of is like, when do we get to do as Trump did and start hollering, you know, witch hunt, persecution, it's all fake news. Like, because the leftist doesn't really do that at all. Not that I'm even saying we should, but you know, if there was ever a case of like witch hunting, like, isn't this it? Like, yeah, it, maybe it was cringy to some, maybe it wasn't, you know, whatever. But like, I don't think that there was anything there. Like nobody would kick her out of office because like, oh, you accidentally, you know, sounded dumb for a second. Um, so we're like, when do we get to get outraged and be like, yeah, you're, you're witch hunting. I, I, now I would say (laughs) like, we should be calling that out because that's exactly what's going on. But at the same time, AOC and Ilhan Omar have to be more careful specifically because of the enemy. So, um, at, at that pause there, the other thing I wanted to bring in a little bit is, would you go so far as to say that, you know, the, the wisest move for politicians right now would be to, you know, sort of imitate the Midwestern, uh, you know, newscaster style where, where they are uh, much more carefully choosing their language and speaking in a, uh, a much more neutral, you know, dialect and tone and such. I don't know if I'm qualified to give that kind of advice. What I do think I'm, you know, limitedly qualified to to say as just like an observer who who reads a lot of news and is interested in the political process is you should be asking does doing this thing translate into some kind of benefit to me politically ideologically or otherwise and then the second question should immediately be is whatever i think i'm going to gain from that if i'm going to gain anything is that worth any obvious downsides that can be focused on and highlighted by the opposition and in this case if she had said what am i going to get for using this dialect a momentarily a momentary sort of flourish of relatability maybe but again this is like her home city like these are these are the people that directly elected her Uh, and so i would argue that the answer to that first question would be very little and then the second question of well Given what I could get out of it, which we've just said is very limited, what are the what's the potential for negatives? Uh, the answer to that would have been obvious. Like this could be maligned against me, so on and so forth. I mean, that's really that's really all I have to say on the top. I think it was just a misstep, and hopefully, hopefully, it's not something that's going to be as sticky as the the BS um, anti-Semitism issue with Ilhan Omar.